everybody, and welcome to Scripture Search Fully Interactive Resources for Students and Teachers or First. My name is Rosie Alvaran Seckler, and I will be your moderator this afternoon. If you're joining us for the first time or you're not familiar with us, Scripps Research is one of the largest nonprofit private biomedical research institutes in the nation, and our mission is to develop the next generation of medicines and diagnostics to address the most pressing health concerns in the world such as COVID-19. I want to encourage everybody to visit our website after the webinar. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us after the webinar. Before we move on with the panel, I would like to touch on some housekeeping items. All participants' videos have been disabled and you have been muted. The format of today's presentation consists of a 10 to 15 minute discussion between um, the panelists and myself, the moderator, followed by another 10 to 15 minute Q&A session where we're gonna be taking your questions live. To do this, um, or to submit your questions on the Zoom platform, please use the Q&A button that is on the bottom of your screen. On Facebook Live, you can put it on the comments box and somebody's gonna um, hand them to me. I'll be asking all the questions live and the panelists are going to uh, respond them live. We also want to interact with you and we're going to be doing this on the Zoom platform using polls. And I think at this point, it's a good time to practice the first set of questions. So if you can please take a moment to respond to the questions that are now on your screen. These are to get to know our audience and it's going to help the panelists answer the questions appropriately. And I'm gonna be uh, sharing some of the answers right now. So I see that the majority of you are high school students with some college students and some middle school students and faculty. And there are various reasons why you're here today. So you want to interact with our scientists you um, might be very passionate about science careers and you want to find out more. And um, you also want to ask your questions and make the most of your time um, during this afternoon. That's great. And so without further delay, let's move on to our discussion of the day with our panelists. Today we have graduate students Sergio Labra and Chanel Suda and postdoctoral fellow Dr. Hase Q. And they will be talking about their research careers and they specifically will be also highlighting the different research methods they use to answer their questions. Um, welcome. I think um, to begin, I would like to ask all of the panelists to introduce themselves briefly and to tell us briefly a little bit about their research. And let's do it in this order, um, Chanel, Sergio, and Hasey. So Chanel. Hey everyone. Um, my name is Chanel. I'm a fourth year graduate student in Matthew Pipkin's lab, and we study uh, how uh, CD8 T cells respond to different kinds of viruses and vaccines. Thank you. Sergio? Hello, uh, my name is Sergio, and I am a graduate student at the Kelly lab working on Alzheimer's disease models. Mm -hmm. I am Heisi. Um, I'm a postdoc in Paul Schimmel's lab in California. And um, so in my current lab, we mostly work on unexpected functions of a family of proteins which are involved in um, translating the genetic code. But I'm also going to talk about my PhD for a bit today because that's where we did most of the animal works, the method I'm here for. That's great, Heisi. And so I think that uh, we should start with that question. So I'm gonna ask um, everybody to tell me a little bit about your career so far, you know, for the grad students that your undergraduate career and then Hazy already mentioned um, uh, the, her PhD and coming into um, uh, being a postdoctoral fellow. So Chanel, do you want to start? Um, so for my undergrad, I went to Virginia Tech for biological systems engineering. Uh, for my major and I minored in biomedical engineering since there wasn't a major for it yet. Um, and I was really interested in being able to solve problems, um, but it wasn't, and I didn't really take 
that many biology classes. So in perspective, I was an engineer and, or still an engineer, um, but now I am working in immunology. So I really changed fields there. Um, and like I said, I didn't really do too much uh, biology uh, while in engineering for undergrad, but then I uh, did an internship for bioinformatics and I saw how I could apply everything that I learned in engineering to answer um, more biological questions and that was awesome for me. Um, and while I did bioinformatics, which is where you use uh, different uh, computer programs, you may have heard of R, Python, uh, to solve different kinds of uh, questions. Um, I also saw people doing the bench work or like full cytometry, trying to figure out uh, different kinds of wet lab techniques, and I really wanted to do that. Um, so I took a gap year after I graduated uh, in 2015, and I worked at Stanford for a whole bunch of different kinds of labs uh, for an MD, an MD, PhD, and a PhD to try to figure out uh, what kinds of training that I wanted to do. And from there, I focused on uh, immunology. So that's where I am for grad school. Great, thank you. Sergio? Hi, so I did my undergrad at UPenn uh, for majoring in chemical and biomolecular engineering. Um, even though I enjoyed the practical nature of uh, that, my engineering program, I knew I wanted to do scientific research. And so I joined different labs throughout my college career from cardiovascular different like biological research kinds of uh, labs eventually settling on uh, a very prestigious lab at UPenn doing Alzheimer's disease research where I was able to you know work with human tissue which I thought it was the coolest thing ever and uh, that really fueled my passion for specifically neurodegenerative diseases. And uh, so I knew that I wanted to go to grad school. So I, in preparation for it, uh, I also did a master's in technology. And when looking at the grad schools, I looked for programs that had a a big translational focus because I didn't want to, I didn't not only want to do research just for the research sake, but to really come up with practical solutions for diseases like Alzheimer's disease. Um, and that's how I got here. Great, thank you. I see. Um, I actually did all my education in Germany, so um, I did a biochemistry bachelor's and a master's because that's what I do in Germany, and then started my PhD in um, cancer research, and um, did that for three years, and afterwards I did a short postdoc again in Germany in structural biology, so um, crystallography, looking at how proteins look like. And then I came here to Scripps in 2016, and now we're doing um, very basic research, um, a lot of cell biology components too. And yeah, it's, it's great fun. Great. So I'm sure that many of our attendees today, they are passionate about science. They think they want to go into a, a research career or a career in medicine maybe. Um, so can you, each of you can give us an example of what you do in the lab, maybe a part of your project. And then um, in light of the topic today, uh, use one of your um, research methods that you utilize often uh, so they can get an understanding of what biomedical research is. And let's do it in the same um, order, Chanel, Sergio, and I see. Um, so like I mentioned before, so in the Pipkin lab, we work on uh, how your immune system or specifically T cells respond to uh, different uh, viruses or cancer types. Um, and so for example, I'll start with, um, if you have an acute infection, so say the common cold, um, you normally, so normally you get sick, that's your immune system trying to fight it off. And then about, it's about two weeks in um, hu humans, but it's around one week in mice. Uh, that you fight off the infection fully. And then after that, 
the T cells that are left after they've responded to that infection, uh, they become memory T cells later on. And they're the reason that you don't get a reinfected. So for example, if you see the common cold virus again, you won't get reinfected by it because your memory T cells have already responded and they protect you um, for basically lifelong. So we use a mouse model um, of adoptive transfer uh, where we take um, T cells and we transfer them into different mice and then we give them an acute infection called LCMV, um, which is a different kind of virus that only infects mice. And then, um, so in humans it's two weeks, uh, we look about one week after uh, you infect the mice and, and then we look also a month after to see your memory T cells. And um, we also take in bioinformatics um, kind of approach to this where we analyze those cells that are initially responding versus the memory cells. Um, and we take um, their DNA or RNA. So if you go all the way back to your biology class, you might remember about the central dogma of biology where you have DNA that gets transcribed into RNA and then that gets translated into protein. Um, so if you look at DNA and RNA to figure out what um, kind of factors are regulating um, how these um, cells that are initially responding go into uh, or turn into memory cells or differentiate into memory cells. So that's kind of the big question that we're asking. And we use, um, to analyze the DNA and RNA, we look at different sequencing techniques. Um, so such as RNA-seq or um, ATAC-seq, any kind of these um, sort of techniques that we can analyze gene expression and see what kind of genes are regulating um, how these cells are differentiated into memory cells. Thank you. Sergio? Well, so me working in the Alzheimer's disease field, if we want to come up with solutions or treatments or cures to some of these diseases, we need to really understand how these diseases start, how they develop, so that we can design strategies to come in at the molecular or cellular level to fix those issues before they get worse. And so for this, we need good uh, models of the disease. Because we you know, open up a patient's head and look what's happening inside. Uh, so uh, something that I've been working on is a three-dimensional model of uh, essentially mini brains in a dish where we can take cells from a patient, um, transform them into stem cells, and then differentiate them into neurons and the different cells that you will find in your brain, at least a subpopulation of these cells, and then use uh, gene mutations that are associated with the disease to look at how those mutations affect the function of these different cells. Uh, and so for validating this model, one of the techniques that we use is, for example, immunohistochemistry, where we essentially take these mini brains and we fix them chem chemically, essentially freeze them in place. And then we can use this special apparatus that essentially cuts them like salami. And you get these slices and then you use antibodies to be able to identify with a microscope where the different proteins are aggregating or localizing in the structure of the mini brain. And so that this allows you to compare to, you know, studies that people have done in human postmortem brain tissue of people that had the disease and compare how good your model is uh, to the real thing. Good, thank you. I see. Um, so for a day-to-day -day basis, um, first of all, I think it's important that every day is different and you do something new almost every day. Um, so for example, if you plan a big experiment, say it's an animal experiment, um, you would first start by really making sure that it's worthwhile to look at it, right? So you'd probably do a lot of studies in tissue culture or in another simpler model um, to figure out what exactly you would like to investigate. 
And um, once you have a defined question and you start, um, for example, again, in an animal experiment, um, you would do, for example, you put, a, you put a tumor in a mouse and then you go and you monitor the tumor and how it grows, grows and you, you visit the mice every day, you make sure they're happy, everything is going all right. And then in the end, you um, sacrifice the mouse and you collect tissue and then you further go on and analyze it. So um, some of the techniques that Sergio, for example, mentioned um, also apply for um, yeah, mouse tissues or animal tissues, patient tissues. Um, a lot of the analysis that's going to go on um, will be um, how much information can I get out of one experiment? Like, for example, is it worth doing sequencing? Is it worth doing um, protein analysis? And um, so often you, you work towards and around a big experiment. So you do a lot in preparation and then you do your big experiment and then you do a lot afterwards to make sure that you get as much out of it as you can. Great. So I think before moving to the attendees questions, I'd like to ask you if you can give them advice. So it's a reminder, many of them are still in high school, some are in college. So what advice you give them to start, um, you know, get their first research opportunity or start their research career? And the same order, um, Chanel, Sergio, and Heisen. Um, so I guess uh, if you're looking to start doing research in sort of high school, um, one way I got involved with um, research or just learning more about the different um, fields in science, because there's so many. Um, I started out by doing STEM camps, by attending them, and then eventually becoming like a counselor, and then directing some of them, because then I decided that I was really passionate about science. So that's a really good way to start looking at that um, in high school. And I know that um, uh, Scripps, um, on both campuses in Florida and in uh, Jupiter, in Florida, we have uh, different kinds of summer research uh, programs where you can be a high school fellow and do an internship in the lab um, in high school, which is super. Um, and you can also do that. Uh, there's surf programs. It's summer undergraduate research fellowship, I think that's what it stands for, um, in college too. So you can also apply to do those kinds of internships um, at different colleges. It doesn't have to be your own college. It can be across the country or different countries. It's cool like that. Um, and you can also, another thing that I did uh, was I just emailed a professor that I was interested in doing research in, or if they're a brand new professor to your campus, they're definitely looking out for undergrads to hire, or maybe not hire, but let you do their dishes for a while and then eventually introduce you to different kinds of techniques of research. Um, so that's another way um, of just getting out there and getting involved and trying to figure out uh, what kind of research interests you. Great, thank you. Sergio? So I think Chanel actually did an amazing job describing the different programs that uh, are available to, you know, graduate students and also undergrads. Uh, you know, I, I always thought that you had to wait until college to, you know, join a lab and start doing some kind of research, but that's totally not true. Uh, what I would add is, you know, just keep an open mind, think about the kinds of things that you find interesting, look uh, into, you know, just do a web search and find what kinds of research people are doing in, you know, in your local university, at the programs to which you apply, uh, and find something that will be, that you will find cool to, to do. And, you know, start, start from there. Uh, or read a little bit on, you know, the kind of research and you can, you know, send a cold email. You, you will be surprised the kinds of opportunities that different people will open up for you if, if you just ask. Very good. Thanks. AC? Um, I absolutely agree. If you have the chance to work in a lab, then, then do that. So there's, there's nothing better and nothing which shows you more what you actually do. Or end up will end up doing, and yeah. Also, don't hesitate to act to email people. So most people are nice, and especially towards students. And most people are are glad to hear and to see that somebody's interested. Um, on a day to day basis, maybe make it a habit to just start question why you do things. Um, so later on, during when you do research, you have a protocol you do for the first time, and 
almost always it doesn't work. And then you go back to troubleshooting. And if you're just in the habit of always asking yourself, like, why am I adding this component? Why am I doing this? Um, that's, that, that goes a long way. So um, yeah, just, just put a habit of constantly thinking about what you're doing and also read a lot. So um, reading is a great way to just see what's, what's hot right now in science, what are areas in science. Um, they're dedicated journals, but they're also like good other sources out there. So just you know, keep yourself informed and you'll be, it will be much easier to, um, to get into contact or to even recognize an opportunity if you know what's out there. Right. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Um, I think it's, it's important to, to get a grasp of, of all these, to, to read a lot. You don't always have to pay for articles or journals um, to get access to a lot of um, important and relevant information. And like um, Hasey said, you know, if you know, if you've been reading and, and you know what you want, then when the opportunity arises, you're, you're going to be able to see it and, and to um, approach it correctly. So I think at this point, it will be nice to stop and take the second poll. Um, so we can, we know how we're doing and we also learn what else you want to hear about. So um, please, you know, take a moment to also answer these questions that are now on your screen. I'm gonna be sharing the answers again, like I did previously. And then I, I also want to remind after you have taken your poll that this is a, a good time for you to type in your questions. Again, if you're in, on Facebook Live, put them in the comments box. If uh, you are on Zoom, uh, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So I see that a lot of people already log in their answers. So I know that you're enjoying this uh, webinar. Thank you so much. You're enjoying the scientist stories and um, getting advice about science careers. And um, you also like to hear more about the skills that you need uh, to become a scientist and um, how it feels to be a scientist. So maybe our panelists can talk a little bit more about what they do in the laboratory. So thank you so much. And I'm going to start reading the first question. Uh, is uh, for I see. I am interested in studying abroad. So I am curious, how was the STEM education in Europe you know, compared to on the United States, do you feel you got a better experience studying in Germany or the United States? Um, so studying in Germany is great. <laughs> um, I obviously don't know how it is in the US. So I mean, working at Scripps is also pretty great. So um, I'm, not, I'm not really sure how to compare that. Um, but yeah, so um, definitely do that. So if you can go abroad, absolutely. Yeah, so you will learn a lot about life and things in general. Um, yeah, so in Germany specifically, um, if you're an undergrad, maybe look into if they have an English speaking program, because um, that's not as, as common as you would hope. Um, and yeah, if, if you want to work in a lab, that's again, um, just, just email somebody. So most people are really happy to hear. And um, if you know like what direction you want to go or what city, that's, that's, I think that, that can in most cases be arranged. Um, yeah, also feel free to email me if you like to the specific questions. Thanks. So I'd like to remind again everybody to type in your questions. Um, we don't have any other questions right now, so I'm going to go ahead and, and ask a question of my own. So you all do different techniques. Um, can you tell our attendees if you... Like what, what kind of preparation you did before to be able to do this? Or like, are you able to learn new techniques at any day? Like when you move, is it when you move from your PhD to now your position now, did you have an opportunity to learn um, other techniques? Um, and so let's, let's go around again, uh, Chanel, Sergio, and Hasey. Hey, um, I guess for, um I'll answer it in, in two parts. Um, I guess for me, um, with all the, I didn't really know a lot of biology uh, techniques actually for lab um, until I started getting involved in research. So a lot of it's like, a lot of it is pipetting, um, but I would say like half the time you're in lab and half the time you're analyzing your data too. 
So it's really important that you learn, or at least for me, because I do a lot of bioinformatics, um, or encourage you to do a lot of different kinds of uh, programming languages, like R is free, it's great. There's Python, also free. Um, MATLAB is not free, but also a great tool to use, but there's or Java. Um, just to kind of get involved with any of those things. And I think it's applicable to not just immunology, but all over the place um, is using more um, high throughput uh, sequencing and lots of big data um, right now. Um, so that really helped me get along uh, with doing a lot of bioinformatics analysis. Um, and I learned programming before in undergrad and I, it helps me now. Um, but a lot of that was in MATLAB, so I used a different language, and now I use a lot of R. So you basically never stop learning if you're going to be in graduate school. Um, and if you're just starting out with techniques and everything, um, yeah, the best way is to get into a lab, and then you can learn all these different kinds of techniques from pipetting to analyzing your data uh, to doing, we do infections and mass transfers too, mouse work. So there's tons of things that you can do in vitro work too. Um, and a lot of those things, if you're nervous about getting into it, um, normally each lab has their own way of doing things, so they will teach you um, what's the best way for their lab. And if you go to a different lab, they'll teach you their different way of doing it too. So the more different kinds of lab experiences you'll have, the more, I guess, <laughs> the size experience, um, you'll know kind of um, what you enjoy doing and what you want to keep doing. Great, thank you. Sergio? Yeah, I, I totally agree with what Sean is saying. Um, I would say uh, as I moved through different labs, there were skills that uh, and techniques that were uh, often reused, but different labs would have like their different ways of doing it. Uh, and then I would pick up some additional techniques along the way. Uh, uh, for me, it's been kind of an interesting journey because of my background. I always did a lot of biochemical kind of research. So I am still doing a lot of the same techniques that I was doing back then. Uh, but I picked up uh, in vitro cell culture work, which I had never done before. Uh, and you know, as with every skill, you start doing it, they teach you, and you get better with practice uh, up to a point where you can teach others. And so you are constantly learning. Uh, and it's, it's pretty exciting. It keeps things, you know, from getting monotonous because you are getting, you are doing a lot of different things often at the same time. So that's, that's always something good. Uh, out of the, the work we do. Yeah, that's great. Um, hi, C. Um, I again absolutely agree. So um, you always keep on learning, and you always should keep on learning. And um, I actually went through a bunch of techniques um, during my research life, I guess. And um, you you keep some things you keep all the time, right? So you always pipette something. You um, basic tissue culture skills I think are always useful. Um, but often if you have a new biological question, um, you don't know how to address it. And then you might have to go out and find a tool with which you can actually answer it. Or you have to invent the tool um, because it's so new, right? Nobody knows how to do it. Um, if you're lucky, then you can learn things from a colleague. Um, for things like animal work, there's often designated training. Um, but very often it's literature work. So you go through the literature, you see what everybody else is doing, you see what everybody else has published and described, and you hope that the description is um, accurate and, and easy to follow. And um, you can also often reach out to colleagues who've done the same or done something similar or done something which you think you can you know, then take and apply to your own problem. Um, and that's, that's I think, one of the most fun things that you, you try to figure out how do I solve this new problem and what can I use that I already can. And the more you know, the more options you have and the better a solution you might find. Great. Thank you. Thank you for all those answers. I'm sure that the attendees are, are leaving away because they, I'm sure they're thinking like, oh, like when I get first to a laboratory, how am I going to learn all these techniques? And um, rest assured that somebody is going to teach you all these techniques at the different levels. So now we have um, a bunch of questions, which is great. Thank you. Uh, so the first question I think is for Sergio. 
Do mini brains look like brains? And when working with cells, do they form tissue systems? Um, well, the, with enough Im imagination, I, I will say, yeah, they, they do like little, little balls of cells uh, that are kind of floating around. Uh, the, the cool thing about the techniques that we are using is that they will, you know, different cells differentiate into different types of cells and they arrange themselves. They migrate in a similar way to how uh, the, the brain in a fetus of a baby will develop over uh, the gestational period of a pregnancy. Uh, of course, because it is outside the body, it doesn't develop quite enough, quite right. It's missing things like blood supply, so they don't grow as big. They can be like, you know, two, three millimeters in size. And so, you know, they, of course, cannot think, uh, but they are still good enough to ask medium to complex questions about uh, what may be happening in, in such an environment with different kinds of cells interacting and working together. Great, thank you. So what are, the, the next question, what are some common pitfalls young researchers fall in and how can they uh, be avoided? Um, who would like to take on this question? You can raise your hand. No. <laughs> Chanel? No, that's okay. Um, I guess uh, some common pitfalls that I think younger, so I'll just say, I guess if you're an undergrad uh, researcher working in someone's lab, um, if you are only working in, um, in like one lab, and maybe you don't enjoy it as much. Um, maybe you can feel stuck and feel like research isn't for you. Um, that might be a sign of you need to go branch out and try a different lab or try a different kind of field or something like that. Um, and you can you can definitely find something that you're interested in. So that's something maybe that a, like a maybe a pitfall can happen of where you feel stuck. Um, another one is that um, I think I see, uh, mentioned this before where I can't remember the percentage, um, but most of your experiments don't work out the first time, which is totally normal, and that happens to everybody. Um, so one thing that we learn is, uh, I guess, like perseverance and grit is something you really need. I don't think that's a skill that you can perhaps learn from somebody. That comes from your own experiences and your own resilience. Um, but kind of realizing that this is normal and it happens to everybody, and, it, and it's not you. <laughs> it's um, just the nature of science. Um, I think that can help you kind of get out of that or feeling stuck kind of phase too. Great, thank you. Um, so another question here, if we are just starting off and don't have many lab experiences, are there any common skills that are important in being a successful scientist? Hacy, do you want to take on this one? Uh, sure. So first of all, I don't think you need to know many methods when you start because you can learn most of it, right? So there's hardly, there are a few where we get a lot better over time, but I mean, we all start somewhere. So you just, you go on and you learn and you get better. Um, I think, I think really um, reading and communicating maybe. So um, getting a good idea of um, what area you're working in. Um, and that will be very specific to each lab you start in. So say you start um, in a neuroscience lab and then you go on and you go to a, um, purely structural lab. They will have very, very different backgrounds with the people know and what they expect you to know. So um, the best way you can prepare yourself also for conversations and again for what questions to ask, what methods do I use is, is doing good literature research. And um, in general communication is really important. So um, if you find the cure for cancer but you can't tell anybody because you don't have the words or you can't make a scheme that, that makes sense, then um, nobody will know. So um, I think communication is something you can work on actively, kind of, and just um, being willing to, to go to people you might know so well or you might be a bit scared of and just asking them questions and, yeah, 
asking them until you understand and always go back and read more of them. Great, thank you. We have a, a question here I'm going to take. I'm not um, sure I completely understand, but I, I like to, to try to answer this question. So um, this person says, I did research through my AP uh, research class in my school and it was secondary science research. She's calling the project secondary science. How do you feel that prior research experience will impact me in future primary research uh, that she hopes to pursue in college? Anybody wants to take on this question? I think any, any kind of research will help you in, in the future. And I wouldn't say that there's anything labeled as secondary or, or primary at this level, especially in high school. But um, if any of our panelists want to say something, then you just raise your hand and then I'll let you. Yeah, Sergio? I, I'm not sure if this is what they meant, but maybe it's the difference between basic and applied research. That's kind of the only thing I can think of. Uh, but it, it doesn't really matter what kind of research you are doing. At the end of the day, you are still applying science, which is identifying an unknown or a problem needed to be solved uh, and designing experiments around to be able to answer the questions that you set. Uh, so, you know, there, there's, there may be different reasons why you may lean or find more interesting to do one science over another, let's say a more basic research uh, coming from a more applied science background. Uh, but any kind of, like as, as it was said, any kind of research will help propel you forward uh, because you are developing that kind of thinking, like mind frame uh, to solve, to problem solve. Right, okay, that's great. And did any of you had a high school, a formal research experience in high school or it started mostly in, in, as an undergrads? You can shake your head or, or not if you had a, you had Chanel? You had a formal research internship? Uh, it wasn't, I guess it wasn't a research internship, but we had, um, I went to, um, shout out if you're from Northern Virginia, but I went to the Academy of Science um, in Freedom High School. So it's where you do a science, um, I guess, more intensive program every other day for all of high school. And the last two years we had an assigned research project um, where you had, I think, two blocks set aside, it's been a while now, sorry. Um, but you had two blocks set aside uh, where you had to work on a research project um, and you had two years to do it um, for that. So that was kind of my first kind of, I guess, adventure into science uh, through that. It's great. Um, I, sorry, oh, I, think comment. I actually don't think I had a really good idea what I got into when I started biochemistry and um, it turned out that I liked it a lot better than I thought I would even, because um, it's really diverse. So you do something different every day. And um, there are also so many areas to go to. So if you discover that being in a lab is not for you, then there's a lot of like science communication. There's a lot of um, consulting. There's patent stuff you can do. So even if you, if you start that and then after a year or two, you see, or even during a PhD, you see, okay, being in the lab is just not something I enjoy. A changed area is still not something I enjoy. There's so many other career paths with a basic science education. So I, I really think it's, it's worth trying, even if you're not, not entirely sure what, what's going to happen. And I guess along uh, that question or that comment, there's a question here. Uh, what if a student is struggling in classes, but they're really passionate about research, would you still say that they should pursue that career? And you guys can raise your hand, whoever wants to. Anybody wants to comment on this? I would say that uh, definitely, I mean, by doing internships, you can figure out if, again, like our panelists said already, if research is for you, 
and then there's always ways to explain um, a few bad grades on on a personal statement. Um, definitely try you know try it out be before saying no to yourself in terms of pursuing that kind of research uh, career. I can comment a little bit on that. Yeah. Um, actually, my grades were not the greatest due to you know multiple different reasons but I always focused on doing a lot of like accruing a good amount of research experience so but even though grades can be important in the process of applying to things like say grad school uh, it is by no means uh, going to forever like block you from from achieving that uh, i am living proof of that so you know school is one thing and then doing research and actually making a difference out in the world it's something completely different so uh don't yeah like pursue the opportunities you you find great thank you um i think before finalizing because I'm, I'm looking at the clock um let's take on um, this final question what was your inspiration to go down the path of biomedical research uh, when did your interest fully develop and i think that we can um, do another round uh chanel sergio and, and hazy okay um I think I mentioned before, so during undergrad, so I was engineering and I was in a ton of different engineering labs before I started any kind of biomedical research lab, which is completely different. So we've talked about pipetting and working with your hands and doing bench work. I was working with hammers and soldering things and doing electrical breadboards. It's very different. Um, so I started out uh, with that and I did an internship. So I had didn't take any biology or whatever until I did my internship um, at Stanford doing bioinformatics and then I saw everyone working at the bench and I was also on my computer but I was sitting with my computer next to them on the bench because I was also very interested in what they were doing um, and then after I had that internship uh, I really wanted to go to grad school to learn all these different things but I knew I didn't have any experience um, so I took um, I was able to take some electives outside of my major, so I took a intro medical medical physiology class, um, and from there they had a lot of different guest lecturers. Um, I didn't know to take that sort of class until someone recommended me to take it, basically, because it was a master's, I guess, level class, but it was open to seniors, and if you're interested, you could take it as an elective, which is very nice. Um, and I took that class, and there's so many different uh, guest lectures from all these different types of labs, and they were talking about their own research, and I thought that was fascinating. Um, and a lot of them, uh, even though they were in a biological, um, I guess, setting, they came from different kinds of backgrounds. So some people will come, uh, of course, most of them came from biology, going into a biology field of research for biomedical research. A lot of them came from engineering or from chemistry. Um, into biology uh, research field. So that's kind of how I figured out that, yes, I can do biomedical research and it's very interesting to me and I want to know more. Um, and how do I get the kind of experience? Um, so I, then I went back to that same lab since I saw that they were doing bioinformatics um, and that they were doing um, bench work. And specifically, I was working um, on a clinical trial they were doing. So I got to get patient blood samples and run around the hospital and scrubs, <laughs> just super fun. And you can also analyze them. We use full cytometry, um, which is another kind of bioinformatic tool that you can use. Um, so I learned all those different techniques uh, from them because I was so interested in all these different things. Um, so that's kind of how I got started down that path. And I ended up looking at um, different immunological diseases, uh, specifically uh, different kinds of congenital heart defects that were caused by different immunology, um, I guess, uh, related syndromes. So that's how I got interested in doing uh, immunology research in there. So long story short is that you can go into biology or biomedical research from any kind of background uh, 
that you may possibly be on, or you can switch completely like I did. Um, as long as you can, uh, as long as you're passionate about the research and you're open to learning, um, and you kind of accept that you're going to be learning for a very long time. Thank you. Sergio? So again, uh, even though I was doing chemical engineering uh, and most of my classes and most of my school work had to do with engineering and, you know, heavy calculus and very applied kind of uh, projects, my, I knew my passion was much more on the biomedical side. So I saw, you know, different biomedical research labs and I kind of picked up the biology that I needed to know honestly from doing it, from doing the actual research. Uh, and it's, it's been, uh, you know, it, it, if, again, if you have the passion, you can really make it, you are not bound by any means, by your previous background, by what you studied or by, you know, a, where a previous research experience, uh, because again, these skills are translatable. It doesn't matter if you are looking at blood diseases or if you are looking at protein crystallography with, uh, you know, on the synchrotron in Europe, uh, or if you are, you know, working with human plasma samples. Uh, it's a lot of the same scientific kind of thinking to problem solve. So uh, people switch fields in a sense all the time. It's, it's very common. And I would actually say that that enriches and makes you potentially a better scientist in thinking in more... Uh, maybe creative or novel ways that maybe someone that has always been on a single field may be able to, you know, connect. Uh, yeah. Great. That was great. Thank you. AC? Um, I like specifically about biomedical research. Um, it's kind of everybody's contributing a puzzle piece. So you need many, many pieces until something comes together and you go and have a drug and develop a drug. But you will also never know what actually is going to be important in the end. So you do very basic research, you figure out a very basic sort of process, and then 10 years later, this is going to be crucial in helping somebody else to take it further and to apply it to, um, to, to a drug or to something that benefits human health. And um, just, yeah, just so the awareness that you're, you're contributing to this big field and to all these other brilliant people um, all working together, right? And we are all benefiting from each other. And um, as Sergio also pointed out, you switch fields a lot, you you learn a lot, you collaborate a lot. And it's just, um, it's it's kind of very satisfying almost to to be able to be part of that. And I also, I get, I personally get a lot of joy out of, um, for example, reading a paper or listening to a talk and somebody does a very elegant, very beautiful experiment and just being able to appreciate that. It's like, oh, so somebody did that and it's so brilliant. and I can't understand what they're doing to a certain degree, at least. And that's, that's, that's in itself is very, very satisfying. Great. Thank you. I think that was a, a great way to, to end up this uh, discussion. Um, a lot of great advice. I want to thank our panelists uh, for joining us today. I am very appreciative of your time. I know that you're very busy, especially during this time that you're trying to uh, get back to your research. Um, we got a few questions about internship opportunities at Scripps. Um, you can find more information on our website. The, um, this year, um, the programs had to be canceled or modified. Um, the deadlines have long passed uh, for all the summer internship programs. So please keep an eye for um, next year's internship opportunities and the deadlines. Um, at this point, I'd like to ask everybody to take our third and final poll uh, to tell us a little bit about how we did. And after we end the call, you're gonna be also redirected to another survey. And we appreciate if you can take those questions as well. And um, there's gonna be a space for you to let us know what other topics you would like to hear about in the future. 
there is uh, our next webinar is this Thursday is going to be a demonstration or an explanation on, on CRISPR Cas9. Uh, this is a hot topic. People uh, would like to learn more about it. So I hope you can join us. That will be the last one for now of our webinars. We'll have two uh, other series in the summer on um, science careers and also a lot of advice on how to apply to internships and how to apply to grad school. Um, so you can learn more about these webinars on the link that it uh, was uh, put on the chat um, very early during our discussion. And also you will be redirected to this page after you visit or you complete the survey. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody for joining again. And until next time.